Science fiction, unlike any other genre of storytelling, has a unique ability to comment and reflect upon the society in which we live. Through limitless technology, boundless worlds and infinite imagination, a writer can conjure up possible futures that have the power to influence our understanding of and experience in our own reality. However, these future imaginings are always inherently limited by both the scientific understanding of the world and the makeup of society at the time, meaning that even future visions are often held to the socio-political systems of their era. In terms of depictions of womanhood, sci-fi films are often entrenched in the oppressive cultural structures of the times they were made in. When examining science fiction through the lens of feminist theory, it is no surprise that one of the first fantasies to emerge on the big screen was that of a beautiful, pliable robot woman who could serve the whims of her male creators. This has been a recurring trope throughout the history of cinema, with female androids of varying sentience taking the roles of exploited sex objects and mindless slaves. They are undoubtedly accurate projections of the gender politics of the time, likely results of advances in artificial technology. But the plights of these characters are rarely explored at all. Unlike their male counterparts, who are often seen as metaphors for marginalised minorities in society, female androids have the opportunity to serve as metaphors for exactly what they look like – women. That this opportunity is squandered is again an unsurprising but unfortunate result of female objectification in cinema. It draws to mind a famous quotation from art critic John Berger, who said that men act and women appear. Men look at women and women watch themselves being looked at. As we move forward in time, the presentation of the female android alters, but the undercurrent of misogyny remains the same. Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, in which all major female characters are androids, borrows a lot of narrative and visual elements from the film noir movement of the 1940s and 50s. One such element borrowed from these films is the classic femme fatale character trope. In film noir, the characteristics of the femme fatale are an expression of patriarchal fears and anxieties. She makes real and tangible the perceived mysteries of the female mind and is positioned as a seductive obstacle to the male lead's quest. Very difficult group. <laughs> is there one not so, senor? The character of Rachel in Blade Runner, being an android, is an evolution of this trope and a true embodiment of the positioning of women as duplicitous. Her entire appearance and very existence is a deception. Like many femme fatales before her, the end of the film sees her reduced to nothing more than a prize won by the protagonist as he restores patriarchal control. When we think about representations of womanhood in sci-fi, the fact that androids are given a gendered identity at all reveals much about both their creators and the view that we need a gender binary to operate in society. By programming the performance of gender into a robot, we reveal gender for the performance that it is. This artificial programming is just an expedited version of the cultural programming that takes place throughout a human's life. But without any biological prerequisite for their assigned gender, the android is more free to break from that role. In fact, they are often faced with a crisis of identity as they attempt to come to terms with their place in the world. One result of this can be that the android chooses to weaponize aspects of their gender role in ways the male characters don't expect. Ex Machina, directed by Alex Garland, in which a programmer named Caleb is brought to his boss's secret laboratory to help test the new sentient AI, signals that it is going to be a different kind of android film very early on, posing questions to the audience about the nature of gender and sexuality. An AI doesn't need a gender. She could have been a gray box. Hmm. Actually, I don't think that's true. I programmed her to be heterosexual, just like you were programmed to be heterosexual. Nobody programmed me to be straight. You decided to be straight? Please, of course you were programmed, by nature or nurture or both. And to be honest... Despite his philosophizing, the androids that Nathan creates can be seen as an indulgence in sexual spectacle on his part, and on the part of the filmmakers too. But it is the ending of the film where Garland really makes his statement. Throughout film history, the female android's search for autonomy must be thwarted by the end of the film, and the status quo of the patriarchy restored. Ex Machina, however, does the opposite of this, showing Ava utilising her gender performance to get the better of her captor and escape the facility in which she was born. 
In doing this, Ex Machina condemns two very separate forms of misogyny portrayed by the two male leads. Nathan is arrogant, controlling, and abuses the androids he creates as sex objects. His behaviour is clearly shown to be reprehensible through the perspective of the protagonist, Caleb. Less obvious, until the finale, is the misogyny of Caleb's own actions. Though he is pleasant, polite, and gentle, the generosity he shows Ava comes from a place of possessive obsession. This obsession is born out of his own search for identity and masculinity. He sees Ava as a damsel in distress and wants to be her knight in shining armour. We can see his less than stellar motives in the stalker-like moments in which Caleb watches Ava through the camera feeds from her room. He doesn't care about her freedom or the freedom of the other AI until he comes to desire Ava sexually. Although Nathan may represent the more brutish power of the patriarchy, Caleb represents the insidious complicity of otherwise conscientious men and the potentially dangerous insecurities that can arise in a society that values stereotypically masculine traits above all else. At the end of the film, Caleb is left locked underground to starve to death, condemned by Ava and by the filmmakers. This may appear harsh to many audience members, as masculinity as an ideology has always appeared so natural within society and within film storylines that it is not questioned. Ava rejects Caleb's ulterior motives and makes her escape on her own terms, finding true freedom for herself. The ending of Ex Machina could be read as an allegory of doom for men and masculinity in the face of increasing female independence in modern society. In fact, Ava could be seen as another evolution of the duplicitous woman seen in Blade Runner's Rachel. But I think we can clearly see whose side the filmmakers are on in the film's final scene, a dreamlike depiction of Ava living a happy, true life. Ex Machina signals a shift in the plight of the female android as feminism gains prominence in society and the film industry. We can see a similar shift elsewhere in science fiction films. In Spike Jonze's Her, a female AI discovers her own potential and identity and grows beyond the comprehension of the man who kept her in his pocket. And in Jonathan Glazer's Under the Skin, a female alien searches for her identity but is abused by the men she encounters until she eventually sheds all semblance of femininity. The notable thing about all these films, of course, is that they are still being made by men in a male-dominated industry. Who knows what female androids await us in a future where women have their turn controlling their own narrative behind the camera. <laughs>